Good morning, class. So today we're going to go over a uh, an ANSYS HFSS simulation looking at SAR and the electric field around a transmitter coil. Um, so first, you know, you'll have ANSYS open. This is uh, R19, which is also known as version 2018.0. Um, so basically, you'll start by having a project and or you have a uh, yeah, you have a project uh, named in this case, tutorial HFSS-SAR. From there, you'll insert an HFSS design. Uh, it's the first option on the list. So we have this. Uh, let's name it uh, Video Demo. And you'll see here it says Driven Modal. Uh, that is the default solution type for HFSS. And we can just go forward and uh, leave that unchanged. So we'll just have a Driven Modal solution. So from there, um, we're going to do a few things. We're going to create our model first, and that's going to entail creating a coil. So with HFSS and other ANSYS project types, um, there's just some built-in tools that make this a little bit easier than doing it manually. If we go to user-defined primitive, primitive segmented helix and rectangular helix, um, this will allow us to create a spiral coil with a rectangular cross-section. If you wanted to do a different type of cross-section, you would use polygon helix, and then you can create you know, three, four, five, six-sided uh, cross-section for your, your conductor. So you have this prompt, and let's go. Make everything visible. So we uh, will start with rect height, which is the conductor height. Um, Rough, so roughly uh, two ounce copper is roughly three mils. So if we do three and then mil, there we go. One second. Uh, rect width, that's you know that's going to be your width of your conductor. Um, pretty self-explanatory. So uh, let's just say arbitrarily it's you know, sixty-seven mils. Why not? Uh, this is your start radius, so this is from the center of the the spiral to the center of the first rectangle uh, trace, rectangular trace. So, you know, once again, pretty arbitrary, 40, mil, 40 millimeters. Radius change is the change from one, change in radius from one turn to the other, so it is not necessarily pitch um, or like gap between traces. But, you know, say we have a 67 mil. Uh, trace width, and we want to have 20 mil gap between uh, that trace and the next trace. So we'd actually be wanting to do 67 plus 20, which is 87 mils. And then pitch. This is actually um, this tool is for three-dimensional spirals or uh, solenoids. So if we're wanting to do a flat planar coil, we can just do zero millimeters. Turns. Let's say we do 10 arbitrarily, um, and the last two parameters we're just going to leave in the default setting. Which is, you know, basically resolution of your of your helix and the direction or the handedness of your coil. So, okay, so let this run for a couple seconds, and there's your coil. So uh, from there, you can do some things to this bottom left, the properties box. Let's just you know rename it to being coil, and also uh, it defaults to vacuum, so we could just say. Uh, let's let's make this a copper coil. Um, and if this option isn't available, you can just click the edit box or edit button, and you'll go to a materials library that lets you pick from you know a couple hundred different materials. So um, okay, and then let's change you know change the color to whatever you want, an orange coil. And also you'll notice to the left that solvent side is unchecked and that means um so solvent side is typically pretty useful for when you when you're wanting to calculate uh resistive loss or power dissipation or anything like that but uh, since we're really just worried about the electric field outside of the coil um, outside of the conductor we can uncheck solvent side and this will also reduce your your memory usage quite a bit um because you're only basically calculate you're only really looking at looking to generate a mesh um outside of the conductor or on, on the surface of the conductor um, from there so we need to create a you know right now there's you know this empty empty nothingness around your coil so you have to create some some sort of 
you know, area. Uh, let's say we want it to be a vacuum or an air box. So typically we've been doing uh, a cubic meter uh, simulation, simulation region. And if you look on the bottom right of the screen right here, um, basically you can tab into it and it'll set your starting point of your cube. And then, so let's do negative 500 for all of them. And then from there, you can see uh, your deltas for each direction. So we're wanting to make it a meter. And these units are all millimeters. That's why I'm putting in 1,000 millimeters for a you know, meter box. So there's your box. Um, and also a shortcut for zooming out quickly is going to be hold Shift and Alt and then use your left mouse button to zoom in, in and out. Um, from there, if you just hold the shift button and use your left mouse button, you can fix your perspective, but move around uh, from that, you know, within that perspective throughout your model. So we have this, we have this region. Let's rename it region, and we have it as a vacuum. Uh, we are solving inside because you know we're going to be interested in the fields inside this box and not on the surface through outside. Uh, we could also make it, you know transparent so it's not too obnoxious um, from there if we're wanting to you know we don't really need to look at this box at the moment so if we go up to the top of the you know, the screen we can say hide selected objects in active view and that gets rid of this box temporarily so there's one more thing we need to add and that is a body part so if we let's say we add the male head um, so this is going to be stored in your personal library or potentially your materials library uh, on your computer. And, you know, it's basically all you have to do is click whatever object you're wanting to look at and drag it into the model menu or model window. So here we go. We have this beautiful, let's make it a beautiful baby blue head. And the material is called human average. Um, this is something you can modify within your materials library. I believe. Yeah, by default, uh, permittivity and I believe yeah, permittivity is set to one. And there's one other property I'm not remembering right now. Um, but yeah, if you want to modify this, you can. I think for the FCC, um, for test labs, they set permittivity to 0.75 roughly. Uh, but for this, we'll just keep with the default, which is one. Um, from there, you know, we're going to simulate SAR on the head, but there's really no point in simulating SAR. When the human, you know, when your sample is, you know, roughly two meters away from your coil. Um, so say we're wanting to put the head within about one or two centimeters from uh, from the coil. So first, you know, we could assume that the coil is at zero on the z-axis, and then we're wanting to see where the head is, say the top of the head. Uh, it looks like it could be right here, and to the left of the screen, you see z is eighteen thirty-five. So Let's say we want to be 15 millimeters or one and a half centimeters from you know below the coil. So we would then so 18, 35, and then uh, we're going to move it down to zero and then add 15. So it's going to be we're going to have to move this 1,850 millimeters down in the z direction. So if you click on mail head and then move uh, and then tab into the bottom right of the screen, put your coordinates. It's it's all relative coordinates, so. I have zero, 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 and we're wanting to move it down 1850 millimeters in the Z. So you can see here, it kind of looks like you have a little halo, um, but the head is now roughly 15 millimeters from the bottom of the coil. So, okay, we have the head, we have the coil, and then we have our vacuum region. Um, but also what we're wanting to do, let's get rid of this for, you know, make this invisible for a second. We're wanting to, you know, you're going to be driving this current source through the coil, so you have to have a closed loop. Um, as you can see here, it's, you know, obviously it's pretty apparent it's an open loop. So we're wanting to create a, you know, a conductor bridge that kind of closes this loop. So let's say we do 0 0.5 millimeters by 0 0.5 and make it, you know, it's pretty arbitrary. You just have this little conductor block. Uh, let's see, let's make it copper. And then we need to add a second one to go over from this point to the inner part of the coil.
So this is going to be let's have it go to this point. Oop, sorry. Okay, so you almost have this closed loop. Um, let's unite these first, so it's a continuous coil, or it's a continuous piece of copper, it's a single single model. Uh, unite, and then it looks like everything's connected well. Uh, we're wanting to, instead of finishing off this loop with a cube or some three-dimensional volume, we're wanting to just draw a rectangular sheet. So that can go, that can, you know, it'll be, as long as you're basically touching both ends, you know, the start and end of this loop, uh, you can, you know, it's, it's really doesn't matter how big the sheet is, um, but this is basically what, what you're going to be using to close your loop. Uh, and then, you know, in a few minutes, we'll go back to why the sheet needs to be there, what you need to do with the sheet. Okay, so. Looks like if we make everything visible, we have this region, uh, we have a coil, and we have a head. So that's going to be our model that we use. And from there, uh, we can go to the left, of the, you know, left side of this project and look at a few different things. So we have our 3D component, which is just the imported head. Uh, if you click on model, it will just show you, you know, what sort of objects or models do you have in your project, as well as you know some other parameters that we haven't touched yet. Um, and then we're wanting, the first thing we're going to do is add a boundary. So we're going to you know, click on this box, select the object, and then uh, assign a boundary. We're going to use a radiation boundary. So just name it you know, whatever you want. There's not really anything else you can fill in here. But now you, know, you click OK through that, and you have a radiation boundary. So the definition by ANSYS is uh, it's a boundary that basically lets a, uh, a radiating object radiate infinitely far into space, uh, typically for antenna designs. But, you know, for our case, since we have a, you know, there's going to be some energy radiating past this one millimeter or one cubic meter uh, region, but it's going to be so many orders of magnitude weaker than, you know, our area of interest, which is right around the head, that we can assume that this is kind of, you know, infinity at the walls of this this cube uh, okay and then from there so make this invisible again uh, we're wanting to add an excitation so if we go to our sheet oops, sorry a little wonky uh, we're wanting to get our sheet this is going to be our current source right here so if you just click on the sheet object uh, ex assign excitation current you can call it coil current, and you're going to define the direction of current flow in your, uh, you know, in this sheet. So you hit new line, and then you'd say, let's say current, you know, goes from negative z to positive z direction. So it's defined, and now we have this current sheet right there. Um, so you know, one thing to note, if you look here in the bottom left, uh, there's two different parameters: current magnitude and current phase. So current magnitude is peak. Um, if you're wanting to do, you know, just that's one thing to keep in mind because if you're wanting to change that to, uh, you know, if you're wanting to do RMS current, uh, you're going to have to multiply by uh, your current, your peak current by square root of two. So if we're wanting to do one amp RMS, we're going to have to put in 1.414 amps in that setting. Um, and also, if you're not happy with the direction of your, you know, your current and you don't feel like redrawing it, you can always just change the phase to 180 degrees. Um, and also, these things are, if you drop do the HFSS drop-down menu, um, go to fields and sources, you can actually modify this current magnitude and phase in this uh, in this menu. And it's really helpful for post-processing because it lets you run the simulation and then uh, vary current levels and see how your fields and your star measurement changes with, with current after you've already run, you know, done all the heavy lifting with ANSYS. So from there, we're wanting to create a mesh um, of our objects. So if we select our coil, uh, right click it, or right click, you know, after you've selected the coil, hit assign mesh operation on selection, length based, and then 
we can just rename this coil coil mesh and uh, you know I typically will just go with the default um, the default max element length because you know it's not necessarily as important here as if we're doing resistive loss calculations or anything where you have to solve inside the conductor then you have to worry about the skin depth uh, but for here you know ANSYS their default uh, max element length is pretty yeah, I've never run into issues with it, but I just changed it to 20 because you know run numbers are nice. So uh, from there we have our, our region and we're wanting to this we are wanting to do a mesh operation inside the selection, not on it, since we're interested in what's inside the the region. So this is region mesh. Uh, yes, yeah, so just go with the default value, hit OK. So now you have two uh, two mesh operations happening. And one thing, if you're wanting to get better resolution around your coil, like in the direct vicinity, uh, there's a trick where you can put another vacuum region um, that's you know much smaller, that's just you know basically in the direct vicinity of your coil, and you can create a smaller mesh for it, or I guess a uh, smaller uh, mesh with smaller elements. And this will increase you know memory usage and computation time, but it will give you higher resolution uh, in a region of interest. If you're inter if you're wanting to do that, uh, from there let's let's see. We go to analysis, and actually first, uh, yeah, yeah, let's go to analysis. So this is you know first menu. Let's change our frequency to 300 kilohertz. Uh, max number of passes. So typically. Uh, this is something you'll have to determine experimentally or through doing this multiple times. Uh, and it depends also on your convergence criteria and your max delta energy. But uh, for this, we've, I've had luck with, you know, basically having it converge on under 10 passes. And this is uh, max delta energy. So this is the percentage that your, uh, this is the percentage that your energy is changing in your simulation per pass, so as the mesh gets refined. Um, so, you know, right now it's 0.1%, but we've also, you know, I've seen, I mean, it's pretty easy to achieve. Actually, I believe, yeah, I, I've seen it in this simulation be as low as like one to the negative six. Um, but, you know, to be safe, we could just do like 0.1 or 0.5 or something, and we'll be okay. Um, so then you can go to the options tab, and, you know, keep this as default, um, adaptive options. So this is also a minimum number of passes is something that you're going to have to determine experimentally um, by looking at, you know, what what's your delta energy per turn or per pass. And typically I've seen it, um, you have a pretty stable delta energy after about five passes or so. So we can go with five. And then after that, if you have stable delta, delta, delta energy, which is underneath your your limit of 0.1, uh, that will be seen as a converged pass. So if you want to, you know, really belt and suspender your your setup, you can say we want the minimum, min, excuse me, minimum number of converged passes to be, say we want it to be stable for like five passes, which is kind of absurd. Um, for now, we could just keep it as one. But if you, you know, you can always feel free to add more. Um, and solution options. So iterative solver, I typically select this radio button because uh, it's a little bit less RAM intensive and easier on your computer if you're using a personal machine. But if you're using, you know, HPC or Nimbix or anything, uh, you know, Direct Solver is typically, you know, pretty pretty quick and it, but it does use more memory. So uh, either of these options is okay with HPC. Uh, advanced, we keep, you know, we don't change anything there. Hybrid, don't change anything. Uh, expression ca cache is interesting. We'll come back to this in a in a minute. Derivatives we don't touch, and defaults we don't touch. So you see an exp expression cache. We uh, it says there's it's not available until a solution has been created. Well, that's actually kind of a, a bug with an ANSYS. And so you know you see that there's nothing here right now. But if we click OK and then reopen the analysis, we have this option to add expression caches, and that's basically giving you another. Uh, Instead of just converging about delta energy per pass, you can have it converge on you know any sort of field value, say like the electric field, magnetic field, along some geometry. Um, it really helps you, you know, if that's your 
you know what you're interested in in the simulation, it's good to add that to your expression cache to make sure you're getting repeatable results that that are converging about um, the criteria that you want to converge on. So I'm gonna act out of this really quick though, because say you know, say we're wanting to converge uh, on an electric field about some line that we have in this ob in this model. So let's create this line. Um, Let's start at zero, 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 and then make it, you know, make it 10 centimeters. So we have this line here. Can't really see it, but we have a line. We've got an X out of it. Call this uh, Z axis line. So if we go back into analysis in our setup, uh, and say we're wanting to we're add an expression cache. So we have the z axis line and we're wanting to say we want it we're wanting to make sure that the electric field on that line is converging uh, you know per as a function of you know as as we go through our simulation so we added that click done and then our convergence criteria say are we want it to be within you know five percent delta uh you know in order to converge so we add that and uh, this so this will also be added on in addition to your max delta energy from the start. Uh, be a basically your delta of your the magnitude of your electric field on that z line will also be seen as a convergence criteria. So we have that. Um, let's see what else. Oh, so optometrics. Um, optometrics is basically allowing you to do parametric, uh, making the you know do parametric simulations where you sweep certain variables. And in this case, we want to say uh, in a real test environment, basically this radiating object or coil will be put on a table and rotated 360 degrees. And wherever the hotspot is, or the greatest, you know, basically the greatest electric field or the highest SAR, uh, measured SAR, that is going to be the SAR value that's used, you know, submitted to the FCC. So if we want to replicate that here, um, we can either rotate the head or we can rotate the coil or, you know, uh, I guess we could even rotate the bot, the region, which is kind of weird. Um, but to do that, you know, you're wanting to rotate your current source and your, and your coil. So we click both, uh, control click both. And then we're going to hit rotate and up here, rotate about the Z. Let's say we rotate it. Well, let's start with zero and then you'll see why in a second. Um, so we want to open that back up, right click on the rotate command, edit properties, and let's say we want to make this parametric. So that could be called, our angle could be called rotate. And this will basically generate a variable that you can you know, put whatever value you want, in, uh, you want into the box and you know, it's specified as an uh, it's a angle and units of degrees, which is zero, so apply. But you know, by creating this variable, when you go into optometrics now, you can uh, you can add a sweep with that variable. So we're going to add uh, a linear linear step for the variable rotate. It starts at zero degrees, ends at two seventy, goes in steps of ninety. So hit OK or add, then hit OK. Uh, if you click on the table tab, you see we have four different vari or four different values that we're looking at, uh, which gives you you know. Pretty low resolution, but you have four different points um, that you're going to be looking at SAR with. And then, you know, in general, we continue through here, calculations and options. So go going to options, uh, you're wanting to make sure that fields and mesh are saved, because if the field isn't saved, you know, fields aren't saved here, you can't calculate anything for these. Uh, you can't calculate any SAR values for this optometric sweep. And then for calculations, uh, say we're wanting to. Uh, say we're wanting to calculate the electric field on on our z-axis line. So, oh, actually, sorry, I take that back. Let me delete this, and we have to go back really quick because we're wanting to ultimately calculate SAR uh, from this sweep analysis. So we have to go into HFSS fields calculator and. Here's basically a bunch of different field, you know, calculated. Uh, here's a bunch of different values that have been, or like built-in 
variables that you can calculate from the raw data that Angels generates. Um, we see things like mag e, mag h, all the way down to uh, average star or local star. So, but say we're wanting to let's let's generate a few things. Let's let's look at you know take the electric field, which is the complex vector, uh, and then let's hit the smooth command. And basically, so it's so for how Ansys works, it generates these polygons, and there's these discrete points on the polygons where the field values are calculated. Uh, but because of that, you know, on this discrete point, there's four, there's, you know, there could be X number of polygons around this discrete point where their vertex or vertice is, uh, they're all, they all share a common vertice. So the smooth command is basically, basically averaging out those values um, for each polygon on that vertice. And it just, it's, you know, it's just a, uh, I guess it's considered kind of a rule of thumb to do for, uh, for these simulations. And from there, uh, say we're looking at the, we're wanting to see the peak value uh, in the electric field in general. So we do complex peak. Um, and then we add it to our library, we call it peak E. And then say we want to do uh, you know, average SAR on the head. So we hit geometry, the volume, and then it's the head. And then we want to know the max value. So. From there, we have a scalar uh, scalar value, which is just saying the highest SAR value on the head in our model. We call it max average SAR. Now it's added to our fields calculator. So going back to optometrics, uh, let me run through this really quick. We got to save it to zero to 270, steps of 90. Here we go. Uh, save our fields and mesh. Calculations, set up calculations. We are wanting to do, let's see, this is fields. Max average, sorry. So this is what's going to be guaranteed to be calculated across each, uh, you know, across each sweep of your variable rotate. Hit OK, we have optometrics. And then from there, uh, we basically are completed our you know, our setup of our model and our analysis. And we would hit simulation, uh, and then under the, the ribbon bar here and click validate, and we see a you know, nice green checkbox, that's nice. So from there, we would just click analyze all, and it would you know, run through the simulation, and uh, it, it'd actually run through it four different times because of your parametric, your optometric sweep. Um, and each one takes about 25 or 30 minutes on my computer and about 10 gigabytes of RAM. Um, and it does converge successfully, which is nice within you know, the first five passes. Um, but from there, so I already have a completed version. We just click on that. So we would say we're interested in a few things. Um, one would be, of course, star value across different rotation points. Um, what's the highest star value on the head for rotation of zero or 90? Say. So you hit results, create fields report, um, and then you would be looking at max average SAR, and the primary sweep will be your rotate function uh, or rotate variable. So we already have that, and I'm just going to open up right now, and we see uh, it only calculated for 0 and 90, and then I aborted the simulation. But um, for you know, you see for 0 and 90 degrees, you have two SAR values that you can compare. Uh, from there, so you're also looking at your electric field along the z-axis, which is you know our convergence criteria that we added uh, beforehand. And you know this is just kind of showing so that x-axis is actually the z-axis, and then this is our electric field for a, I believe it's a one amp source, uh, one amp source through the coil, yeah, one amp peak. Um, so you know those are if you're looking to generate plots or data tables, you do, do it through the results tab. But for field overlays, um, say we're wanting to look at the electric field on our YZ plane. So we go to planes, drop that down, hit click global YZ. Uh, then we're going to right click in our, you know, in our uh, model window and say plot fields, plot E, mag E. And from there, we don't have to select anything else. We basically did all the heavy, uh, all the work before we got to this prompt. 
and you hit done. Um, so what that's going to look like is, is this. Uh, I believe this is a this is yes yeah, this is in the YZ plane, and you can see the electric field and how it's changing as a function of distance throughout throughout this plane. Um, so let's make this invisible really quick. Right click mag E, plot visibility, uncheck. And but ultimately we're interested in the uh, you know say we're interested in the star field about you know on this human head. So what you normally do is you click the head, uh, right click, plot fields, other, and average star. And as you can see, I kind of alluded to it a few seconds ago. But if you look at average star, it shows you know where the peak values. You can get a you know pretty good heat map. Let's make this invisible for a second. You get a pretty good heat map of where the hotspots are in the head relative to the coil. Um, so yeah, that, that concludes this lecture, and uh, I hope it's been beneficial. And once again, this is uh, using ANSYS R R19. So uh, you know, and there's plenty of plenty of guidelines within the ANSYS HFSS online help document uh, if you're ever stuck. And yeah, I hope it's informative.